You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. We return to the situation in the Middle East as the White House at this hour is weighing potential responses to a drone strike conducted by Iran-backed militants that killed three U.S. troops on a base in Jordan and injured dozens more. The president over the weekend said that those responsible will be held to account in a manner and at a time of his choosing. While there's some pressure coming from Congress, hawkish senators like Lindsey Graham, or John Cornyn, who are actually pushing the administration to strike Iran directly, something that the U.S. has not actually done in decades and that they may be hesitant to do because of concerns around escalating what's happening in the Middle East. Iran, I should point out, has said that accusations it was directly involved in this attack are baseless and said that resistant groups in the region do not take orders directly from the Islamic Republic. So let's get the latest now with Peter Martin, who is Bloomberg's global defense and intelligence correspondent and is joining me here in studio. So, Peter, do we know, first of all, how directly involved Iran was? Are we taking Tehran at its word here? Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, American officials treat those Iranian statements with a high degree of skepticism. Um, Iran has, as you know, a network of proxies throughout the region. Um, Some of those proxies are very tightly controlled. Others, uh, there's a little bit more leeway. But when it comes to taking decisions about killing American soldiers, um, about supplying um, these proxy groups long term, I think it's fair to say that the administration looks at Iran as very much culpable here. Well, and the fact that three soldiers were killed in this, this isn't the first time we've seen U.S. troops as casualties of what has been going on in the Middle East since October 7th and this war erupted between Israel and Hamas. So theoretically, you would maybe expect that this would be the strongest response to anything we have seen because troops actually died. But how strong is strong here? When they're saying it's going to be stronger than the current uh, operations they're conducting, going after the Houthis and these Iranian proxies, what options realistically are on the table? Well, you know, the administration needs to tread a very careful line here. They've been worried ever since the outbreak of hostilities following the October 7th attacks that there's the potential here for a uh, for a broader regional war. There have been clashes on Israel's northern border with Hezbollah. There have been the, the Houthi attacks that you mentioned. And of course, there have been these attacks by Iranian proxies from Iraq and Syria, which most recently uh, led to this watershed moment where, where U.S. soldiers died. Um, So the administration is going to be looking to send a very strong message. Those that we've spoken to have said that they recognize that the response needs to go above and beyond what's happened before. When it comes to something like striking Iran directly, that's a pretty difficult decision to take. And it's something that certainly um, would risk a a kind of broader regional conflict. And they're going to be pretty cautious about that. And is the primary concern that Iran would retaliate in kind or that it would just kind of exacerbate what we're already seeing with these Iranian proxies and the activity and operations that they're conducting specifically. I I guess my question is, would Iran really want to go after the U.S. directly either? The the assumption um, ever since October 7th by, you know, but from U.S. officials has been that Iran, too, has a lot to lose, right? They're on the threshold of having a nuclear weapon. Um, They are benefiting in many ways from from being able to strike at... um, Israel through proxy attacks uh, and also strike at U.S. forces, um, but without very much direct risk to themselves. Now, critics of the administration's approach have said that unless the U.S. is willing to put Iran and its own assets at risk, then there's the risk that these attacks will just continue to escalate and won't be deterred. The administration, on the other hand, has said that they need to take a cautious approach because there's a lot at stake here. It's the broader regional economy. There's the threat of prices increasing mm-hmm. as um, attacks on shipping increase in, in the Red Sea. Um, so a lot of different things to weigh. Well, and of course, that's why it took so long for the U.S. together with allies to actually move to offensive, even against the Houthis. For a long time, it was just defense and deterrence in the Red Sea until those strikes began a number of weeks ago. And of course, Peter, when we first saw that initial uh, strike launched, the U.S. together with the U.K., we've seen, I believe, about eight of them now. It was done while the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, was still at Walter Reed in the hospital as he was getting treated for prostate cancer. As we weighed the response here, he's back at the Pentagon. 
today, right? He is. He's meeting with the NATO Secretary General today. He's back in the saddle at the Pentagon after a, a long delay. Does that actually impact anything other than optically? Is it easier to kind of conduct these conversations when the stakes are so high? Uh, I mean, the, the Pentagon has, has uh, strenuously denied that his his physical absence from the building has impacted um, operations. But I think it's fair to say that any organization works better when those in charge are close to what's happening. All right, Peter Martin, Bloomberg's global defense and intelligence correspondent. Thank you so much you. for joining me. And we want to get more analysis on the situation now with Dan Mouton, non-resident senior fellow at the Scowcroft Middle East Security Initiative at the Atlantic Council's Middle East programs. Thank you so much, Dan, for, for joining me today. I want to read you, if I could, a quote from a, a Bloomberg opinion piece that was written by Admiral James Stavidis, who wrote, the Pentagon should generate detailed strike plans to go after Iranian targets themselves. They could include warships operating in support of Yemen's Houthis. Another target set could be Iranian oil and gas platforms in the Arabian Gulf. Even more controversially, he writes, the Pentagon could consider strikes against Iranian military command and control sites. Dan, what is your assessment of what a proportionate, appropriate response would be here? Are any of those options on the table in your mind? Hi, Kaylee, and good to join you today. I, I think what Admiral Stavridis uh, portrayed in his opinion piece is absolutely mm -hmm. part of the menu of options that uh, that the Department of Defense, as a matter of course, would generate for for the president in terms of adhering to the president's remarks yesterday that we're going to respond appropriately at a time and place of our choosing. I do think, though, it's it's important to note some of the other pieces that I think Peter Martin also highlighted, which is this attack did not originate from Iran. It was an Iranian mm -hmm. proxy group versus uh, Iranian forces directly. Now, obviously, there's there's culpability that Iran needs to be held accountable for. But in terms of the people and organization and kind of commands that were given to launch this attack, uh, it's important to dig into that in terms of how we uh, evaluate a proportional response. And when I say that, I would go back a little ways to, to highlight why you know, the Department of Defense at the president's direction surged forces to the region after October 7th of, of last year, which was to prevent escalation into a regional conflict after the October 7th uh, Hamas attack against Israel. I, I think in terms of the president's choices, he's going to be given uh, this menu and it's going to involve either striking back against elements of Qatar, Hezbollah in Syria, perhaps elements in Iraq. And obviously there's going to be Iranian targets, but he's going to have to weigh uh, the likelihood of escalation. And I'm happy to dig into that a little bit more if you'd like. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, how likely do you think it is that whatever measures the U.S. takes here would be significantly more escalatory than the measures the U.S. already has taken? The multiple strikes we have seen against Houthi targets in Yemen. Does the calculation change entirely or at least the stakes move consequentially higher if there were to be a strike directly on Iranian territory, which we haven't seen for decades? No, it Haley, I do think that if we were to strike inside of Iran, that would, uh, excuse me, Kaylee, I, I do think if we were to strike inside Iran, that would increase the likelihood of regional escalation. Since this attack did not originate from Iran, and, and, and right now we don't know if there were Iranian, literal Iranian fingerprints on these one-way attack UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, it's hard to draw a direct line. That being said, if we move a little bit to the left and look at the organization responsible for launching the attack, uh, there are a, a whole multitude of Shia militia groups in both Syria and Iraq that have been involved in attacking U.S. forces. I, I note that there's been close to 160 attacks against U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria following October 7th. Yeah. And so all of those all of those attacks were meant to kill U.S. forces. There was an increasing likelihood over time that sooner or later something was going to, unfortunately and tr quite tragically, get through U.S. defenses. And when they did on on uh, Saturday, it became inevitable for us to respond. I do think, in terms of the choices available, 
what we're likely to see is a much more comprehensive set of strikes against these Shia militia yeah. groups that are directly responsible for the attacks. Well, and, and Dan, your point is well taken that this isn't necessarily Iran itself that is responsible here. And of course, we've heard from Iran in the aftermath of these attacks that the groups it backs operate independently from the direction of the Islamic Republic. They say any allegations that they were directly involved are baseless. Nonetheless, though, if it's providing money and weapons to these groups, Iran, at the end of the day, if you go down the line of fault, is in that line, right? So I just wonder how the Iran's Iran's backing of these groups can realistically be stopped if the U.S. is not willing to go after uh, Tehran directly. And, and, I, and I think that's that's a very, very valid point, Kaylee. I, I think where we are, where we're going to be right now is going back to the last probably to late October up through the last few weeks, we've heard statements from Secretary Tony Blinken, UN Ambassador uh, Linda Thomas-Greenfield and others, Department of Defense, White House, and so forth, messaging directly to Iranian decision makers that there will be repercussions. I think at this point, we should expect, uh, you know, any Iranian players in, in this attack scenario that are operating in Syria and Iraq that are directly aiding and abetting these attacks I would expect them to be on the table in terms of uh, what the United States is willing to target. Uh, I, I think thus far, it's going to be difficult. And this goes back to the desire by the U.S. administration to not escalate. Uh, it'll be difficult to choose to strike directly into Iran. Now, to Admiral Stavridis's point, there's Iranian... Uh, you know, warships, if you will, or, or Iranian ships affiliated with Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps that are operating outside of Iran's territorial waters that in some instances mm -hmm. could be very well aiding and abetting these attacks. And so uh, that could very well be on the menu of options. And I think the Iranian yeah. government needs to be made aware of the repercussions of, of this continued targeting or aiding and abetting this continued targeting of U.S. forces. So, Dan, obviously, while we await news on potential, uh, what the potential response from the U.S. could look like, of course, all of this is happening against the backdrop of the ongoing war between Israel and Hamas. And we know that also over the weekend, there was a summit in Paris with spy chiefs and other officials from the U.S., Egypt, Qatar, and Israel trying to reach some kind of ceasefire agreement in exchange for the rest of the hostages that are still being held in Gaza. And a headline actually just crossed the Bloomberg terminal from the Qatari prime minister saying that hostage talks are in a better place than a few weeks ago. How hopeful are you that a deal like this could actually come to fruition? And how could that change what we're seeing across the Middle East? Because theoretically, if there was a ceasefire, the Houthis wouldn't have as much reason to attack vessels in the Red Sea, right? Indeed. I, so I, I completely agree with kind of the, the connection you just drew, Kaylee, to these attacks, regional escalation from October 7th. I'm quite hopeful that what was going on in Paris this past weekend, as well as the work that preceded this, and this was White House coordinator Brett McGurk going to, going to Cairo, going to Doha, Qatar. Right. This was in the lead up to Director of CIA Bill Burns uh, traveling to Europe the other day. I, I'm quite hopeful that this could, in fact, be an opportunity for both sides to de-escalate. This is principally right now focused on helping the government of Israel find it a way out of the scenario that unfortunately it, it it fell into following as a result of the October 7th attacks. But this is the best chance at the moment for us to find a de-escalatory path to help the government of Israel find its way out and reduce civilian suffering in the Gaza Strip. And just finally, we have less than a minute left, Dan, but we know that there's been some discussion as to whether this should be, say, a two-month ceasefire or a permanent ceasefire. Can Israel really agree to a permanent ceasefire at this point? That That's going to depend on the political calculus. And and I, and it's impossible, I think, for me to answer that, Kaylee. It's going to be the political calculus inside of Israel of... I, I personally do not think it's possible to destroy, a, you know, the the foundations of a terror organization. Israel can kill a lot of members of Hamas, yeah. But 
the the cause of all this, that's going to be quite difficult. And it's going to be up to the Israeli government to determine when they've met that. All right, Dan Mouton of the Atlantic Council, thank you so much for joining me. Really appreciate your time. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. I'm Kaylee Lines in Washington, where we have a border deal on the mind. And to put it in the words of the former President Donald Trump, a bad border deal is far worse than no border deal. That's what he said on True Social over the weekend as we await the release of the actual text of this deal that Senate negotiators have been working on with the White House for some time now. And while we don't know for sure what's in it, we do know there already has been some pushback against it, specifically in the House of Representatives, even coming from the Speaker himself, Mike Johnson. So is this effort really going anywhere? Joining me now to weigh in is the Republican congressman from North Carolina, Greg Murphy, who is here with me in our Washington, D.C. studio. Congressman, thank you so much. Nice to see you, Kelly. For coming in. It's great to see you as well. What needs to be in this deal for it to get your vote? Will you You even have a chance? We have to go back to the the stay in Mexico policy. I mean, I think that was the stalwart of where all this began. We had Central American countries that had bought into this, that uh, they folks to seek asylum in the country of entry rather than transgressing across across all of Central America. You know, I've worked in some really desperate places in the world as a surgeon, so I understand people's desire to try to find something better. That said, we are a nation of laws. Unlike the last two years, our border has become lawless. We don't have operational control of our southern border. Drug cartels do. So we have to keep those who want it in this country, they want to keep in Mexico. We have to get rid of the uh, control of the border by drug cartels. We have to ensure safety uh, to our own border and really uh, adjudicate the processes a lot quickly. We have to make sure that those who do have true asylum um, Uh, desires that they get adjudicated much more quickly, and that we have to beef up security. You know, we've had, what, eight-plus million individuals come in the country over the last uh, two years. We have close to, I think it was 1.7 million individuals come. We don't know who they are, where they're from, where they're going, why they're here, and the record number of individuals who were caught on the terrorist watch list. We don't even know who the ones who've gotten away because they're going to seek other methods to get in anyway. So this is not only a humanitarian crisis, it's one that we that the president and his administration have broken our own laws. It's also one of national security, even more importantly. So uh, this, is, this has to be done. It almost takes primal uh, 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 immediacy above almost anything else. We, and you get into the debate with Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Um, it almost has to take a precedence over that because we have to protect our own border really before we worry about other countries. Well, the president is at the table now. He's been involved in these negotiations. He put out a statement late Friday that said what the negotiators are working on would give him the authority to shut down the border if it was becoming overwhelming. He says he would use that authority on day one after signing this bill. Do you take him at his word on that? He had the authority right now. He doesn't need authority. He could have the authority to stay in Mexico policy. Boom. He had this authority when he was sworn in. And so he basically invited our countries to be invaded because that's that's nonsense from uh, President Biden. He has the authority right now to do this. So when it comes to the fate of this package in the House, do you think you will even have a chance to vote on it up or down? I have to see what it really entails because I haven't seen the the, uh, text yet, as they pointed out. We want something. But honestly, Joe Biden has the tools right now to close the border or close it appreciably. Well, you haven't seen the text. The Speaker of the House hasn't seen the text either. And already, just based on the rumors that were floating around, he said it's dead on arrival. And we know that he has a close relationship with the former president. The former president has thoughts on this. How does Donald Trump factor into this calculus? Well, I think, honestly, we have to see what's going on because, you know, it's presumed nominee that Donald Trump is going to be the, the Republican nominee. Um, this is going to be a factor because this is one of the biggest things that all Americans now care about, not just in uh, not just in Texas or Arizona, but they care about it up in New York City and other places about the absolute explosion of this humanitarian crisis. And, and Kelly, to be very honest with you, this was one caused by certain releasings of policy by the Biden administration. We should not be where we were. We weren't this way two and a half years ago. We have to get back to some sensible things about immigration within this country. 
Well, when you when you talk about how immigration is an issue, not just at the border, but in states really all across the country, it's been described to me as every state now is a border state Absolutely. because of the way this is spread around. What justification would there be to not bring it to the floor, to not give members like you even a chance to cast their votes on an issue that is so important to voters? Well, I, I don't disagree with that thought, but I think it's also up to the speaker that he be involved in this process. Mm -hmm. It's not just won by the Senate and do with the uh, uh, with the White House. And remember, there is another chamber. Um, we are the ones who are considered in the in the in the House to be quote, closest to the people. This is a people issue, and I think it needs to be not uh, you know debated or guaranteed and silent. It needs to be festered. Especially, we have a new uh, Speaker of the House. He needs to be intimately involved in these negotiations. Yeah, and there's questions as to how the Speaker is not just going to deal with potentially bringing this issue to the floor, but also a vote on a tax agreement. I know, sir, that you sit on the Ways and Means Committee. Yeah. Obviously, this is bipartisan. It's bicameral. Would it have your support if you had a chance to vote on it this week or next? Well, we had a 40 to 3 vote in um, in the committee. I voted for it in committee. Is it perfect? No. There are some things that uh, I may have un recommended differently. Um, I think if we bring it to the floor, I think it would pass just on a suspension vote. We're going to have some folks having problems because it didn't have the SALT mm -hmm. uh, issues with it. Some of the others um, who vote against everything seemingly this Congress are going to vote against it. Um, but I think it may have a good chance of passing as a suspension. We need to do something in the tax realm because of expiring um, tax provisions from TCGA that are really going to be helping American business, especially small businesses. I'll give you an example. With the, quote, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, this really absolutely destroyed pharmaceutical industries from being able to take new drugs and bring new indications for drugs along the line. You know, it's thought CBO said maybe one drug would be taken out because of all this price shifting. It's actually been more than 100. And these are days of new cures. You know, in medicine, I've practiced now for 35 years. It's been an explosion in the last five or 10 years of new drugs and new therapies. And so many of those now, now have come to a screeching halt because of the rules within the Inflation Reduction Act. But if we're able to get these um, companies started back up again, we're going to go back to making land-breaking and really world-breaking cures uh, for many different things, cancers and other, uh, other disorders. Well, so obviously there's a lot in this agreement. As you point out, there's a lot that's not in it either, yeah. maybe not getting the this SALT action that some would like. Others are taking issue with the expansion of the child tax credit. Yeah. Do you think any of these issues are enough that this bill stands a real chance of not getting through the House? Because the suspension of the rules is a decision the Speaker will have to make. Sure, sure. And that's a, I think that's a fair um, criticism of this. Uh, you know, we live in a divided Congress with a one-seat majority. We don't own the Senate. We don't own the White House. And if we want to get a tax package out, there has to be negotiation and compromise. Do I think 2500 should be the, uh, the bottom part? Absolutely not. I mean, absolutely not. Should I think that um, we have person's one-year year income being able to count for the next? No. But then again, you know, this is all negotiated. I do I think $400,000, really. I think we actually probably should lower that. I don't see a couple making $400,000 needs assistance with their kids. But again, this is negotiation. And, you know, this, this is one of the – I've only been in politics, I guess, now seven years now. In the effort, we can't make everything perfect. It's not going to be perfect because we don't have supermajorities in either chamber. We don't have the White House. We have to make compromises. And so, yeah, sometimes there are some things in there you don't want. Um, but if you look at the bigger picture, I think there's a lot more positives than negatives. And, of course, in addition to sitting on ways, of, ways and means where you are very hands-on with this issue, you also are a member of the Veteran Affairs Committee. So I know you pay close attention to matters regarding the U.S. military. And of course, we had news over the weekend. Three U.S. troops killed in Jordan in a drone strike by an Iranian-backed uh, militant group. The U.S. has vowed to respond. Yeah. What do you think that response should look like? You know, Kaylee, I come from a very strong military district. We have Camp Lejeune, Cherry Point, other military bases. One out of ten of my constituents are veterans. And in, in dealing with Iran, in dealing with these axes really truly of evil, as, uh, as Reagan said, the only thing that they know is power. The only thing they know is strength. And this is what we have to show. You know, of course, Iran has said they didn't have to do anything with this. No one can trust the Ukrainians. No one at all. I, I, don't, I don't trust them at all. We have to show them power. I do believe a lot of the strength we lost in the way we left Afghanistan in the Middle East. And so it's time for Biden to step up. I, you know, we have to go after these folks. We have to go with the origin of them. We have to take out their leaders. We have to take out their ability um, to, uh, to kill Americans.
There have been some senators, John Cornyn, Lindsey Graham, for example, who have said strike Iran directly on its own territory. Do you think that would be uh, too far? I, I th uh, you know, just on first thought, I think that may be a little bit, uh, we're not ready for that yet because mm -hmm. here we are trying to keep uh, Israel alive. There's uh, China's threat with this in the southeast with Taiwan. Um, our utter disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan, in my opinion, led to the Ukrainian conflict. Um, I think that uh, that's going to be difficult. Sadly enough, you know, during the Trump administration, the enrichment of uranium in Iran was around 4%. We know Iran has now gotten it up to at least 60%. Some reports have been 80%. And once they get 90%— Well, he, he left that nuclear they, deal with Iran. Yeah, but the thing is, that gave them all of the uh, cards. It gave them all the cards. And so now Iran may very well have a nuclear bomb. And so— you know, I understand that sentiment, but I think a lot of thought needs to go into before that happens. All right. Well, we appreciate you giving us your thoughts today, Congressman. Very good to see you. Thank you for coming and joining us in our Washington, D.C. studio. Thank that is Republican Congressman from North Carolina, Greg Murphy. Now we want to go back to our signature political panel. Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano are with me. Jeannie, just to begin with you on this idea of potential retaliation here coming from the Biden administration, how difficult politically let alone militarily, is this to make? It's going to be very difficult. And I think you just heard it from the representative's thoughtful reply to your question. And, you know, the differences he may have from some other Republicans and some other Democrats on where the United States should strike um, and, and how. And, you know, because we know that there will be a retaliation. We know there will be a strike. And the question now is where and against who and how. And there's so much difference of opinion on that. So it is, you know, going to be threading a needle, a needle rather, for the Biden administration to try to do this in a way that doesn't escalate tensions. Keeping in mind, we have heard that this strike back is welcome. And so this is something they also have to keep in mind. And politically, they are going to be walking a very fine line and trying to make this happen. Well, and Rick, of course, they're doing so not just in any year, but in, in an election year. How does this kind of geopolitical tension factor into electoral politics at home for an incumbent president? Yeah, look, it's one of the fundamental things that voters look at is, you know, are you equipped to be commander in chief? Obviously, both these candidates, Donald Trump and Joe Biden, have direct experience in this and can evaluate that. But some of Biden's biggest hurdles, biggest problems in his administration have been related to the military. Afghanistan was the beginning of the decline of his popularity around the country. And some blame that as being a, a really proxy for competency. And so this is really important to Joe Biden that he get this right. He's he's given full support against a lot of headwinds to uh, uh, to uh, Israel. And, and a lot of voters have rewarded him with some very positive numbers in that regard, but the blowback is still coming when this occurred. But let's be straight. Um, this is a retaliation against us for the proper killing of uh, their head of the uh, Quds forces, Soleimani, and two other mm -hmm. senior operatives that that were killed in um, in in uh, Lebanon recently. I mean, we are already in a shooting war. Uh, with Iran and their and their proxies. And, and I can't imagine a scenario where we don't get more escalation as a result of this latest attack. Well, and of course, the background to this is the ongoing war between Israel and Hamas. And, and Jeannie, there was a, a great piece in the New York Times over the weekend about black pastors, more than a thousand of them that represent hundreds of thousands of congregants nationwide, issuing a demand to the Biden administration for a ceasefire in Gaza, especially knowing how, how important that demographic is to the president as he seeks re-election, should we expect that he is going to put more pressure on Israel specifically to end these hostilities? Yeah, and I think they are already. And I'm so glad you raised the pastors. They have joined with the pro-Palestinian groups that primarily headquartered in Michigan, a critical electoral state for both the president and the former president to win. And of course, you see 
Burns already trying to negotiate at least a ceasefire. So I do think that is something the president has been doing, will continue to do. And this pressure is important because this is a constituency we saw in South Carolina over the weekend that the president does need to come out and support him. And you hear the pastor is drawing a very clear red line. We cannot support you if you don't move forward on a ceasefire and negotiate a settlement or push Israel to negotiate a settlement in the Gaza Strip. So a lot of pressure on the administration to do that at this point. All right, Jeannie Shanzano and Rick Davis, our signature political panel, thank you so much for joining me. Of course, there are those ceasefire negotiations that are happening. They happened over the weekend in Paris, and those conversations are continuing. The Qatari prime minister saying in the last hour that they're in a better place than they were a few weeks ago. Stick with me on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. We track the money on this show as well as it relates to politics, including as it relates to former President Donald Trump. Because talk about money. We all know on Friday he was ordered to pay $83 million dollars to E. Jean Carroll in damages for defaming her. And in a separate civil fraud trial in New York in which we could get a verdict this week, he could be on the hook to pay $370 million in what prosecutors say was a legal profit reaped by his Trump organization by lying to banks about his wealth to get better terms on loans. So when you add all that together, $370 million plus $83 million, we're talking more than $450 million million dollars that he could be forced to pay. Maybe that's not that much for a billionaire, except that he's a billionaire on paper, not necessarily when it comes to liquid assets. According to the Bloomberg Billionaires Index, he has about $600 million in cash, so more than $450 million, and that would be a big chunk of it. Joining me next here on Balance of Power on both Bloomberg Television and Radio to talk about this, I'm pleased to say, is David Ehrenberg. He is the attorney, state attorney for Palm Beach County down in Florida. Dave, great to see you here in our Washington studio. If we just begin with the E. Jean Carroll case, this $83 million he was ordered to pay, he says he will appeal it. How long should we expect this process to take? And is it likely that that dollar amount is going to move significantly lower? Good to be with you, Kaylee. First, I think it's going to take a while. It could take several months to get through the appeals. But as far as whether the verdict is going to be dropped, I doubt it. And that's because the uh, big whammy here, the punitive damages, were only about three and a half times the compensatory damages. So a lot of times appellate courts will say, "Uh, it's way out of whack, let's reduce the punitives. But that's not the case here. Plus, if they want to dispute the evidence that was admitted into trial, well, tough luck because Trump's overmatched attorney, Alina Haba, did not object to a lot of the evidence. And so you waive your right to appeal it. So I think this verdict will stand. It's a question of when the money will flow to E.J. Carroll. Well, and of course, that's not the only money we have to consider here. As I mentioned, there also is potentially going to be a verdict coming down this week for his other civil trial in New York, the fraud trial, as it relates to the Trump organization. How do you how likely do you think it is that he'll actually be on the hook for more than three hundred million dollars in that case? I think the sweet spot is probably around three hundred million. Really? Now originally the Attorney General of New York was seeking up to two hundred and fifty million and then she expanded it to three hundred and seventy million. So I think it's gonna be around uh, the amount between 250 and 370. And I think it's because the evidence has been really strong that Trump did inflate the value of his assets. Plus, he was allowed by the judge, Judge Ngoron, to issue broadsides against the court. I mean, he even was allowed to give his own partial closing argument without having to be subject to cross-examination for it. And I think the reason why Judge Ngoron did that is because he was setting the stage for a massive verdict in favor of the attorney general and wanted to protect himself on appeal. So that's why I think Trump got his day in court. He got to lash out at the judge, but in the end, he's going to pay for it. Well, and he may have many days in court still ahead, not just when it comes to potentially appeals in these cases, but he still is awaiting trial in criminal cases, four of them. He's been indicted on 91 different felony charges across these four indictments. So 
just not even thinking about monetary damages he has to pay, but just legal fees to fight all of these different battles. I mean, how much do you think realistically he's racked up here? Millions and millions, but he's able to convince gullible supporters to pay for some of his fees. Remember, he had this huge account to pay for the uh, stop the steal to fight the election fraud, but then he diverted a lot of that away. And I think you'll see the same thing here is people who donate to his PAC, some of that money or most of it will go to his attorney's fees. And it will hit him in the end because he'll have to pay himself the money that goes to E. Jean Carroll. He'll have to pay himself the money that uh, goes to the state of New York in the civil fraud case. But as far as the expenses for his attorneys, as long as he's got these rabid supporters who will pay the last 50 bucks from their social security disabilities check to a billionaire, he'll be able to pay his lawyers. Well, maybe one of the ways it helps to be actively campaigning for president of the United States is you're fighting legal battles. But of course, there's also difficulty with fighting these legal battles while you're trying to campaign, especially if you're tied up in a courtroom during the primary process or onto the convention in, in the general election as well. But a lot of that will come down to the timeline realistically. We're still awaiting a decision on his argument that he should have immunity as a former president from prosecution in the case here in Washington, where Jack Smith has brought charges against him related to efforts to overturn the 2020 election. Jack Smith would like that to go to trial on March 4th, but it can't until we have a conclusion to the immunity dispute. While we await for that to come down from the appeals court here in D.C., why do you think this is taking so long? You know, I thought this would be decided already. It's a kind of an obvious question. No, a president cannot send uh, hitmen to go kill their political opponents. I mean, come on, right? But this court, I think, is taking on a bigger issue, the extent of presidential immunity beyond this case. Perhaps does it apply to the outer uh, layers of your power, your decision making? Because right now, the courts have said you've got civil immunity, but they haven't really weighed in on the extent of criminal immunity. And that's where I think the court is working up decisions. This could tell me that you could have a concurring opinion, perhaps by the lead judge, Judge Henderson, who was appointed by George H.W. Bush. He may want to weigh in on this. So that's why I'm thinking that uh, this thing, it's a little troublesome because it's going to delay the trial in uh, Washington, D.C. beyond that March 4th date. Uh, but the more complicated the decision will be, the more likely the Supreme Court steps in, and that will lead to further delays. So you think it makes it more likely if this is a broader reaching uh, ruling that the Supreme Court takes it up than versus if it's if it's very narrow? Yeah, I think they should just take the narrow question because justice will be delayed and denied, I think, if this thing is pushed past the 2024 election. It is Trump's best legal defense to delay this matter and then become president again and then call off the dogs, drop it all. So it's really imperative for the courts to weigh in and do it fast because right now the court is supposed to have a trial March 4th. That's not going to happen. But the longer you wait, the worse it is for the cause of justice to prove that no one is above the law. Well, and you talk about how if this happens after the election, if he ultimately is elected, he theoretically could pardon himself. That's not true of state cases, though, like in Georgia. But the difficulty there may be the question of, of the district attorney who brought the charges against him and all of those other defendants, Fonnie Willis, because of these allegations that essentially she has a romantic relationship with someone employed to work on the case who has made hundreds of thousands of dollars. Dave, what do you make of that and how that case is likely to move forward with these questions hanging in the air of, of what exactly she's done here? Kaylee, I'll admit it doesn't look good. This is my counterpart up there, Fonnie Willis. It doesn't look good, but the evidence is the evidence. And so this case will move forward whether or not she has to take the lead prosecutor off the case or whether she's removed from the case herself. The facts are still the facts here. And if there wasn't enough facts uh, here to get to the jury, the judge would have already dismissed the case. He hasn't. We've already seen multiple defendants cut plea deals. That's because they've got a decent case here. But yeah, admittedly, uh, there, there looks to be something wrong there when you have this kind of relationship. But in the end, it's not a true conflict of interest because it's not like the prosecutor and the lead prosecutor are on separate sides. It's not like one's a prosecutor, one's a defense lawyer. They're both on the same side here. So I think a lot of this is smoke, but, you know, that's enough to get someone removed from the case. But even being on the same side, does that really matter if someone is reaping financial benefit from being on this case, being paid to work this case? Is there not a conflict of interest argument to be made there? Well, he's getting paid like all the other prosecutors. Now, there are special prosecutors. He's one of three on the case. So he's not the only one. He's been paid the most because he's billed the most. I think, to me, the thing that bothers me the most in all this is not the relationship, but it's the fact that he's been billing, for example, 
24 hours in a single day. Well, you know, maybe when you're a big law firm and you're double billing, you know, you can get away with that. But when you're working for the government, you really shouldn't be doing that. So it raises some questions in my mind. Well, and of course, because this case has so many different defendants, we were expecting that this may be one that takes a really long time to actually actually get to trial. To go back to your point on the idea that this March 4th trial probably is not going to happen on that date, it could be delayed because of this question of immunity. Obviously, the documents case in your home state of Florida is another one to consider here. Is it likely in your mind that any of these actually come to a conclusion before the election in November, or even before that, the Republican convention in July? Of the four cases, two of the four will definitely not uh, be tried before the election. And that is the strongest case, which is the Mar-a-Lago documents case in my neck of the woods. That is the best case for prosecutors. They've got them dead to rights. But with Judge Cannon, who's been slow walking this case, they're not trying that case before the election. The other one is the one we just discussed, Fonnie Willis in Fulton County. Because it's a complex RICO case with so many co-defendants and now with this controversy, that's not happening before the election. Mm -hmm. That leaves the Washington, D.C. election interference case, which is a strong case. And that case was built for speed by Jack Smith, only four counts, yep. no other co-defendants. But we've got that issue of presidential immunity. I still believe it will be decided before too long. And then it's game on in front of Judge Chuck and here in Washington, D.C. Yeah. And the fourth case is the one in New York, the one on the Stormy Daniels. Yeah, that one I think could go before the election as well. It's just not the strongest case. All right, Dave Ehrenberg, thank you so much as always for joining us, the state attorney for Palm Beach County. We appreciate your time. Thanks for listening to the Balance of Power podcast. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find us live every weekday from Washington, D.C. at noontime Eastern at Bloomberg.com.